Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Nathan Cassiotis. I'm a serial entrepreneur, international speaker, results strategist, business coach, mentor, and consultant. Today, I have an awesome guest. He is a serial entrepreneur, partner, board member, managing director, and co-founder of Food By Us. Food By Us is an online marketplace that connects restaurants, cafes, and caterers with hundreds of wholesale food suppliers. He started Food By Us with the founders of Menulog, which is a one-stop procurement shop platform for small to medium-sized venues looking to search and compare the market with transparent and consistent pricing, no credit applications, and access to the buying power and choice normally reserved for much larger businesses. Welcome, Ben Lipschitz, and thank you for being on my show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome, mate. I'm sure it's going to be awesome for everyone watching and listening today. So you're a very successful entrepreneur. So for those people who don't know who you are, just, uh, yeah, please introduce yourself by telling us about you and your journey. Yeah, sure. Um, how did I get here? Well, I, I studied law uh, and I, I didn't want to pursue a career in law. And, and so at 24, I started my first business. That was in uh, shoes. A friend of mine and I created a folding shoe brand basically for women to take their high heels off and they unfold the shoe. It was called Flipsters, very sort of innovative Aussie design. We ended up selling that around uh, 16 countries around the world um, and sold that business after a few years. Um, we, we actually got acquired. Um, on my next venture was sort of looking for different business partners and ended up meeting up with uh, Gary and Tim, my current business partners, we were working in a data analytics company, looking at a few things. They had been involved in ben Menulog, and we decided in 2016 to basically venture off and start Food by Us. So, yeah. Awesome, mate. Um, very cool. Very awesome journey of, um, yeah, starting quite younger. And I think we all have a story when we get into business of not necessarily following the career and then uh, going what, what else is out there and, and uh, yeah, fixing a problem in the market. Love that, mate. Um, so, Let's initially start a little bit with the first business, Flipsters, right? You started at a young age in your 20s um, because I think a lot of people may be, um, you know, thinking about businesses depending on the age. So just initially, what key lessons did you learn from starting that first business? Um, well, uh, <laughs> a lot. I, I always view Flipsters as sort of like my, my, my sort of free MBA or, or my very expensive MBA, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, I think if I sort of knew at the end, um, you know, if, if I knew in the beginning what I knew at the end, I probably would, would have done uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And I guess that is a learning is that uh, naivety can be um, a weakness, but also a strength. So because it sort of jumped headfirst into it and was sort of working things out along the way, it was my first business. I didn't really have any experience. I certainly didn't have any experience in footwear. Um, for me, uh, learning in the job, definitely uh, so, so something that I got from that. Um, and also I think a lot of the basics about you know, how a business functions um, and, and because what we were doing is manufacturing something and then selling it into retailers and selling it online and selling it internationally, got a really good idea of I think supply chains, uh, cash flow, margins, all of these sorts of things. Um, and each of those touch points also had things like online advertising, you know, shipping, logistics, and so on and so on and so on. I viewed it as just a really good way of getting across how a business runs, where things can go right, where things can go wrong. Um, and ultimately, because we sold, I also think it was a learning and understanding how to create value um, and, and, and how others will perceive your business you know, when it comes time to, to acquisition. So there's a, a, a lot in there and, and probably a whole lot more when, when sort of more wrong than right. Um, but it had a good ending and I think, yeah, it was, it was just a really good, good experience. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Very powerful stuff. And, uh, like you said, you sort of learn things along the way and, and awesome to hear, uh, you made that happen. So a lot of cool things for people to think about, um, if they're, um, in that early stage of their business. So, um, now let's get into, into the, the main topic of today, which is um, Food by Us, right? So you, you founded Food by Us in, in 2016, uh, you know, with the, the founders of Menulog. So do you want to just initially probably just tell us a bit more about it and how it helps the hospitality industry? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as you said, you know, 
what is it? Well, it's a one-stop shop for restaurants, cafes, caterers, anyone in hospitality to order all of their wholesale supplies. And I guess the question is, okay, well, well, why does that exist? What's the problem here? Uh, A lot of people don't know that, say, there's 90,000 independent restaurants in Australia. So I'm not talking about, you know, McDonald's or any of the bigger guys. I'm talking about this sort of burger shop, pizza joint, places like that. Of, Of those independent venues, just a small one is going to have 10 to 15 individual wholesale suppliers that they need to order from. There is no Coles or Woolies when it comes to wholesale food ordering. So you've got a fruit veg guy, you've got a seafood guy, you've got a meat guy. And so every single day, they're having to order through all of these different suppliers. And every single day, it's a phone, a text, a fax, an email. Some of them, you call your order in down a one-way voicemail. It's never never answered on purpose and at about midnight someone comes in from the supplier and they sort of listening on the phone and transcribing you know what, what's this person ordered so the problems there I mean are, 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 are huge you know it's a lot of time there's a lot of opportunity for error there's absolutely no transparency how do I know that the lemon I'm buying is correctly priced from my supplier relative to the market a whole lot of challenges there in terms of reporting um, not to mention when one chef leaves and another chef comes you got to teach them this whole sort of archaic system of doing things. Um, so th- that is why we exist, to really provide um, huge time saving, huge transparency. And we also have a lot of group buying power now um, that we can lend to the little guys so that you know, they're able to really, r- really use the network of over thousands of restaurants, which is what we've got, um, to procure in, in a lot better way. Yeah, love that. Love the explanation. Awesome stuff there. Sounds really cool. And... <laughs> Like I know from my knowledge that hospitality margins can be a bit tight, right? Once you sort of add all the costs and everything involved with actually yeah. having the business. So, you know, how, how does food bias like help with reducing those costs and, and increase those profits at the same time? Specifically? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So if you look at the pie chart of say the costs of, of a typical restaurant, roughly a third is going to be rent. Very hard to change rent. It's, it is what it is. Uh, and a roughly a third is going to be wages. And that too, you know, is largely set in terms of minimum wage and things like that. But the other third is food costs. And it's in that third where you have negotiating power, you have the ability to run things like specials, uh, there's seasonality, there's all sorts of fluctuations. Typically, a restaurant might operate on a net profit of something like 4 to 7%. And it's typically made on the food supply side in terms of their costs and, and, and clever management of that. So how do we save their money? Well, we're providing them with group, group buying power, but there's also huge time saving. All the reporting is free so they can actually see what they're spending on and their costs over a period of time. Um, and once they're done ordering through Food by Us, everything integrates automatically with zero or their chosen accounts package. So it's in there, in the books. You're not looking at the end of the month to see backwardly what did I spend and how did I go, which is not what you want to do. You're looking live. You know, every day it's getting pushed in. Every day you're seeing your PML sort of update. So a lot of ways you can sort of save time and money in there. And crucially, it's in the bit of the pie chart that kind of matters the most. Yeah, love that. Love the visual and, and explaining all of that definitely is awesome. And I guess just, um, you know, if someone was doing it, so how easy it is to begin using the platform if you know, we wanted to just sign up? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Let, let's talk about not on the platform because I, th- I think there's a lot of people don't understand about that. You yeah. want to use a supplier. Uh, there's thousands of them. There's, you know, even just fruit veg, there's hundreds and hundreds. Um, you know, you call them up. They might give you a price book. It's, it's, it's especially for you. You know, so there's hundreds of price books flying around. Um, and then they'll give you a credit up and then it will take maybe one or two weeks. And then you can start trading with them. And um, so, so there's that that sort of lead up period just to getting your business going. And that's for one supplier, you got a time is it by 15. Uh, with Food by Us, you just log in. So it's free to sign up, it's free to use, it's absolutely no credit card fees, no usage fees, nothing like that. And because we have done the hard work of onboarding the suppliers and so on, um, you can just go and order from whoever you want and you pay right through the platform. And that, that's sort of what we call our, our preferred supplier range. And that's, that's the core group that we really work with. At the same time, you know, every restaurant's different and there are some suppliers and things that maybe we don't have or they really want to add into the network. And that's fine too. So we do give chefs and owners and restaurants the ability to say, hey, I want to use my fruit veg guy or my meat guy. I don't want to use your preferred one. And that's fine. And then they add them in 
uh, to the network and we help facilitate that order as well. Yeah, awesome. Love that um, flexibility like that. So, you know, I guess, so if we're wanting to open up a cafe or a restaurant, um, yeah. we've, we've got the two options. You've got like preferred suppliers. You can just say, hey, here's amazing suppliers that can just yeah. basically take everything. So it just takes um, so easy to open up. Um, or like you said, it gives that flexibility at the same time, right? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, you don't want to go to a restaurant and say, we're a one-stop shop. But then, hey, you have to use these few hundred suppliers, you know, and our, our preferred suppliers are great. And generally the best experience with us is if you use the preferred suppliers. But we, we don't want to be um, you know, limiting our customers in terms of how they want to run their venue. So ultimately, you know, the major benefit is, hey, get it all in a one-stop shop. Uh, if that involves loading up some of your own suppliers and your own products and things that you specifically want to order, that's fine. We'll help you do that. You'll still see everything. Um, but then, hey, here's some price comparisons and preferred suppliers that, you know, we work most closely with. Yeah, love that. Um, and, you know, relationships are a big part about business. So, you know, you, yeah. you're catering for that as well, which is um, very cool too. Um, so maybe let's go a little bit deeper into the hospitality tech ecosystem. So, um, you know, I guess you're, you're sort of changing the game, um, let's call it now, of how that works. So, you know, what should it look like, I guess, in, in that way? Yeah. Yeah, so the hospitality tech ecosystem, I think it, it, it's a topic I'm very passionate about. And I think that for us, when we set out to build Food by Us, one of the things that we looked very, very closely at was what do we want to be? What do we want to not be specifically? And then for the things that we're not, how do we integrate with them? How do we make it from the chef and the owner's point of view really, really easy uh, for our system to communicate with others? And I think when I take a step back and look at hospitality and the tech ecosystem there, that's a really exciting thing uh, where us as players can talk really well to one another to help the venue. So I'll give you an example. Um, when you order through Food by Us, we are doing all of the payments, um, but then we push all of that into, into zero. Um, for for the from the accounts point of view, so that sort of integration is really you know easy to do, um, and we're looking at all sorts of other integrations where perhaps you know from a point of sale system that you're using at the front of house to actually go you know and and and, and tell like put input what the customers want when your inventory there starts to go a bit low. What do you need? You need more supplies. Okay, cool. That should plug into food warehouse as well. So there's a lot of that. I think um, that the we as a tech players need to understand what we do and what we what we do better together, you know, for the benefit of the venue. Um, and, and sometimes that comes down to a better customer experience for people like you and me entering into the venue. That might be two hour ordering or things like that. Sometimes it's happening within the venue, in the back of the house, you know, like accounting and, and supply system and things that consumers would never see. It's all got to talk to each other. Yeah, love that. Really awesome stuff. And um, yeah, that collaboration. So I guess, are you sort of, I guess, to some extent pioneering or at least bringing the awareness to people? It's like, hey, how do we work together so that everybody, you know, works as seamlessly as possible in that ecosystem? I wouldn't say sort of we're pioneering it, but I think Food by Us and all the tech players in hospitality are aware that um, we are all doing distinct functions, but in the eyes of, of business owners who we service, and often it's the same business owners, we're all solutions to them. Uh, and so we best talk to each other because it's in our mutual benefit, you know, as a, as a tech ecosystem to work nicely together uh, as it is for the, for the restaurant and our, our respective customers to, to see us as an aligned solution. So I don't know if it's pioneering. I will say this, though. I think that COVID has definitely cranked up in the minds of um, chefs and owners like, hey, technology can really help. You, you've, you've had people in... COVID who never would have accepted deliveries or, or seen themselves on the Eats or deliver or menu log or anything like that. And then they went on and, you know, that's a tech solution. Lots of online ordering, lots of QR ordering. In our case, lots of looking at the back of house and how they, how they re-engineer supply. So there's definitely more appetite from it, uh, for it from the restaurants, you know, following COVID. So it's, it's, it's definitely gaining momentum, I would say, as a concept, yeah. 
Awesome, mate. Um, very cool. Yes, I know everyone had to, you know, in Sydney at least, you know, with lockdowns, I'm sure it was around the world as well, where, you know, you weren't able to open your doors for how many months, right? So it's like you had had to go online. Otherwise, you're, you're basically out of business. You, you got to do a lot of things. Yeah, going online was one of them. I mean, ultimately, you got to survive. I mean, we saw the changes happen in the back of the house because that's where we help. But absolutely, it was tech that the many venues turned to as, as okay, how do I, how do I navigate this, you know? Yeah. Love that. Really cool. Um, so yeah, just recently you actually just raised uh, $10 million in uh, series A funding. So um, congratulations with that. That's a, that's a massive feat for any business um, to do that. So um, do you want to maybe share a little bit about um, that experience, you know, maybe how the money is going to help, you know, food by us to really, um, you know, get some more expansion um, and, you know, where it's heading to, I guess, from here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, uh, I think, you know, with, with sort of over a thousand venues using us, we're sort of past that, that product market fit stage. You know, is it a good idea? Well, I don't think a thousand venues would be using it if, if it sort of wasn't helping solve a genuine problem. So that's great. Um, we can kind of tick that box. And in doing what we're doing in that sphere, we're the market leader in terms of our footprint and, and the sales that we go through. So great for that. The $10 million is really to scale from a thousand to sort of 10,000. Um, so, so independent venues in Australia is about 90,000. And if you look at some of the delivery networks, you, you know, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, there, there'd be somewhere between, you know, 20 and 40,000 restaurants on board. So great. We want to kind of get to that level of, of being able to help. Um, and so the $10 million is about sales, sales teams out there really, really reaching more customers and servicing them. Um, it's about marketing. It's about building a better product. Okay, so we've spoken a bit about integrations and things like that. We can do so much more um, in, in, in how we really help these venues. And that's really what, what the money's for. We're not looking at overseas or anything like that. There's plenty of opportunity in Australia. Uh, we want to be that procurement solution. Um, if you have a change of heart or career tomorrow and you decide to open a restaurant, you will need zero for your accounting and you will need some kind of delivery partner. And we believe, you know, you, you should be thinking, I need food by us for my procurement. And that that's the the space we have to occupy in the mind of every, every chef and owner. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. mate. love that. And um, yeah, really powerful to understand that um, side of things. And um, let's go a little bit deeper maybe about investors, because I know businesses that want to scale quite large and, and I guess relatively quickly at the same time, normally getting investors is likely required, right? Because otherwise there might not be enough capital to, to really get that um, exponential growth. So, when you were going through that process or in general um, with investors, like what key considerations do you have when you're sort of finding investors and, and getting them on board? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. And, and I think it's particularly relevant when you're raising for hospitality during COVID because that kind of introduced, you know, a, a little bit of a, a additional factor. But I think for us, um, there's, there's money and then there's sort of strategic benefit. And, and we, we tend to look, more of the second one. Um, what does that mean? Okay, well, what's their understanding of obviously the industry, but also marketplace businesses in general? I mean, what we're trying to do here is really connect um, the suppliers and buyers, you know, in, in the restaurant space. And so our investors and the ones that we really tried to look at understand what that dynamic looks like. And particularly in marketplaces, you've got to build the highway before you start putting cars along and, and that is quite expensive and time consuming and you really want an investor I think who understands the journey and the right metrics to look at. So that's probably point one is, you know, uh, do they have, I think an understanding of your business model and, and to a certain extent your industry. Um, but then I think another is, I guess, when I talk strategic in terms of investors, I would say it's what, what is their ability to, I guess, introduce you to others who might help on your journey, whether it's partners or potential customers or, or, or what have you. So that was also sort of a, a, another important one. Um, and I think the final is, is that they, they kind of back you as a founder and share your vision because they may well understand your space and they may, may well have a good network. But ultimately, if they don't sort of trust you as a founder and how you're implementing it and going about your day to day, I, I think you have a potential mismatch there. And that can be damaging for investors and companies alike. You know, so, so really getting that shared vision, I think, is, is also really, really important. And the money is important, but I think those other three things under this, what I've called the umbrella of sort of strategy and strategic investment, 
I think in the long run plays probably a more important role than you know just just banking banking the dollars yeah yeah awesome love that and yeah like i guess there's there's a lot of money around right you can get the money from anywhere but who's more aligned um you know with the whole vision like you said and, and strategy to to really put the business forward and, and uh um less risk as much as possible so you know in the later stages yeah. so everyone keeps moving forward there so love that um so let's talk a little bit I know you're not doing it necessarily with food advice at the moment, but you scaled like the first business internationally, right? Into a lot of different countries and things like that, which is a big feat as well. So mm-hmm. you want to maybe share a little bit about um, your learnings and what to consider if people are thinking about going into international markets, because there's a lot of different factors, um, you know, with different countries and that as well. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think my number one learning from Flipster's days and in going international um, is the timing of that relative to how much you've dominated your own backyard, I think is important um, and then not to be underestimated. And so that, that's one thing we're looking at food by So, so with Lipsters, we got the product, right. We understood what the customer wanted. Um, we sort of had our, our, our packaging and our, our, our sizing and every little bit and piece kind of going and, and our customer base going in Australia. And that's how we started to get international attention and so on. And so I think, you know, with food by us, our addressable market size in terms of independent hospitality venues. So not, not the big guys like McDonald's or anything like that. Independent hospitality venues and what they purchase every year is about $20 billion. It's huge. There's nothing wrong with that addressable market size. So sort of why wouldn't you want to dominate in Australia um, and really sort of flesh out your product and make sure you've got everything right before going overseas? And then I think the other thing in terms of going overseas is making sure that your product or service is really suitable for that market. Um, and at very high level, I'm not going to give a whole analysis here on the, on the two different markets, but if you look at our market generally, like America versus, say, Europe, and if you keep in mind that our product is really for independent venues um, and to make that work, you need a lot of fragmentation, meaning you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of restaurants and you know, tens of thousands of, of suppliers so that the marketplace can function and, and match make. Generally, you know, we look at something like Europe, um, Europe and the UK to kind of go to as a next step because our product is more suited for that. So I think another lesson we're sort of looking at is once we fix it here, you, you, it, it's, it's no good just launching into, say, America because it's a big market and, yay, we're going to kind of play in, in that sense. It's not, it's not enough, I guess. And then I think a third thing is the resource you need to do that. So even if your product's great and you found a potential new market that's really big and addressable and, and tons of markets are bigger than Australia, uh, great. But then who else is there and what resources do you really need to pull it off? Because going over there with the world's best product when your potential competitors there have hundreds of millions of dollars in, in funding, you're just you're going to get eaten alive, you know. So um, I think that those are the sorts of considerations that we're, we're sort of thinking on. And a lot of that is, is sort of brought from previous businesses, so, yeah. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Basically, dominate your local market to the extent, especially if there's a big, you know, scope there, and then look at what's what's the next best fit um, to move from. Yeah, yeah. I think it's obviously different for every business, but this is certainly how we've approached things. Um, and in particular in Australia, where it is so fragmented, and you know, we we can get on the ground, talk to people, get the product out there, learn about how to build the ideal product. For us, you know, there's so much opportunity here. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Love that. Um, so, you know, obviously um, having a business is great, but, you know, having consistent growth in the business is obviously very important as well to, to yeah. build over time to, um, you know, c- you know, have a sustainable business to help more people and businesses and things, um, you know, for it. So um, what, what sort of key drivers, what are you looking at to develop, you know, in, in the business to ensure that, you know, this is occurring over time? Um, I think that, We've definitely have, have had headwinds because of COVID. Um, and so part of, I guess, the last six to 12 months, and I'm sure it's a lot of, there's a sort of similar story for a lot of businesses, is just navigating through that. But at the same time, we've obviously been putting plans in place because it was going to end at some point. Hopefully it mostly has for now. Um, and so that continued growth is is really about, one, expanding our geography. So we're, we're in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane now, but... Brisbane's our, our sort of most recent market, and even Sydney, Melbourne, we, we can dig a lot deeper. 
how do we expand our footprint? You know, sort of thousands of venues into tens of thousands. And then I think um, another key factor is building out the product. Okay, so so it, it, how do we do more of those integrations and become, you know, as I said earlier, that indispensable one-stop shop that anyone who wants to start a restaurant would really come to us first um, as, as their solution. So that's another thing. But I think that growth also keeps coming from layering on different services that we can offer them. Um, not too far from a, we don't want to sort of stretch too far and start offering them everything. But some very simple examples is we started in food, we moved into packaging, we now offer alcohol. Um, soon we'll be offering hospitality supplies that sort of you know, anything from tables, chairs, plates, cups, whatever. So th that layering of additional services, I think, is important. And a number of other things we're sort of looking at plugging in and saying, well, we're already dealing with this part. It kind of makes sense that we we kind of add this on. It helps our bottom line, but it also helps kind of sticking this you know, with, with, with the customer. That's that's our sort of growth plan, I guess. Um, and, and with sort of COVID removed or largely removed, we, we can just yeah, go full steam ahead. Uh, with that yeah awesome love that and maybe just to go a little bit deeper on the point because i've i've been in the waste management industry for like you know a long time over 15 years and i know sustainability is becoming a big factor and you talked yeah. about packaging there you know that you're part yeah. of now so like is that what you're seeing a little bit more in the market that people are wanting more like sustainable materials um you know with their packaging and, and things like that so what, what's that looking like i guess from your point of view because that wholesale like back end is obviously where a lot of it is going right because yeah. that, that's moving through the system so yeah what are you seeing and, and how are sort of people um reacting and are there different options and things i guess for that as well yeah i think that kind of um uh, i guess topic is is definitely getting more airtime, time um and i mean not just packaging but how how we as an industry and how an individual restaurant can contribute you know, to being a better sort of player within within um, the environment and, and within sort of something that's just more sustainable, however you want to take it. Now, if we take the example of packaging, a few different ways that we're seeing that. So one is uh, the actual product itself. So is it biodegra biodegradable or recyclable or, or what have you? So that's a restaurant saying, I still want to do packaging uh, in, in the disposable sense. Um, so how do I buy the best version of that, I guess, from a sustainability point of view? So that's option one. But then a lot of restaurants are saying, well, why do we have to do packaging at all? Maybe we can have sort of like a reusable system. And so in that case, it's it's sort of like, um, yeah, sort of swap and go, if I can use that that kind of terminology where, where the restaurant kind of is buying in um, just a number of, of starter, yeah, reusable packs. And then the customers who come in, they'll bring their plate and just do a, a swap and take take the um yeah take the food in, in a, a, a equivalent package and off they go so so nothing's ever getting thrown out or recycled so that's a, that's another way I think of of doing it um and so you know our our job I think from a marketplace point of view uh, is to take all of these products um, and in some case sort of product slash services um, and show them on offer for the restaurant. So that they understand their options, you know, we, we are their sourcing partner. So we're, we're not we're not going to come in and say, hey, you should get your electricity from a renewable source. If you want to take the sustainability narrative that way as a restaurant, that's up to you. Fine, or any other number of measures they may want to take. Fine, we're there to sort of showcase, you know, um, it, these are your options, and it may be, you know, sort of vegan options or different kinds of things. However, that restaurant wants to kind of play you know, in that space from a product and supply point of view. That's, that's where we help. That's definitely growing. Um, package is just kind of one of those, those areas, I guess, um, in that broader narrative. Um, and it, it really depends on how that restaurant wants to, I guess, deploy it. Yeah. Awesome. Great answer there. And um, it's good to see that there's some changes happening on those bigger levels because that's where, um, yeah, big change happens in, um, you know, cities and countries and things as well. So love yeah. that. Um, so you're also a board member um, at the moment. Um, so, um, you know, which some people might be thinking about, right, of, of being a board member, whether it's non for profit or profit and, and things like that. So you can maybe share a little bit about that and I guess the pros and cons maybe of, of, of being a board member. 
Yeah, so I'm actually on two boards. And um, I mean, one is obviously the Food by Us board, um, where it's myself and others, are investors and so on. So the, in that sense, I've sort of running the business and also helping work with the board on more strategic things. Great. Um, great to have that perspective. Uh, I'm also sitting uh, on the board of a not-for-profit, uh, which is Redfern Legal Centre, which is a community legal centre uh, based in Redfern in Sydney, and they, they offer free legal advice. They also do a lot of strategic work working on the legal system. In some cases, they'll take uh, class actions, you know, as high as they can to the highest court if possible to really sort of change systemic problems. Um, that is something that I've been involved with for a few years now. Uh, I certainly, uh, in, in how I wanted to give back, I guess, um, and, and everyone has different ways, whether it's charitable donations or what have you, I took the view that I have skills, I have experience, I've, I've run my own companies now, you, you know, for years, and that probably the best way for me to give back is to lend those skills and experiences and, and, and there's many ways you can do that but at a board level uh, I can help sort of out of you um, learning from from the past whether it's strategic issues or staff issues or, or, or risks and things like that so it's for me it's great it's a great joy in my life it's something um, that I've done with Redfin for years now and it's it's a decent commitment but one that's worth it uh, it gives me perspective I think on, on how others because the board is quite diverse. So I'm coming at it from a, obviously a business entrepreneurial point of view, but there are former lawyers and all sorts of other people on the board. So it's, it's good to have that perspective. But I think more importantly, um, for me, I think it shows how um, business people and entrepreneurs can really channel that experience to really give back in, in a really direct and um, you know, helpful way, I think, beyond just say, donations or, or what have you. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's, there's certain, I think, uh, attributes that only business people and entrepreneurs can offer and it. It's great to kind of share those. Yeah, love that. Awesome stuff, mate. And yeah, I guess donations are the easy one, but time is our most precious resource. And, you know, by providing our time to things, whether it's, you know, um, in a board role or even initially before that, you know, going to help people specifically um, with your time is, is always nice to give back mate so awesome that you're uh, making that difference there um where you can really cool um so let's talk about because it's gaining a lot of traction now it's been around for a while but i guess it's, it's more topical about like coaching and mentoring people to help us right along our journey yeah. things like yeah. that so i want to maybe hear it from your perspective about you know through your journey you know have you had coaches and mentors along the way and and now and, yeah. and sort of how has that helped you um you know with your growth and what you've achieved yeah, huge, huge believer in, in coaching um, and, and mentoring and getting mentors. Uh, if I ever talk to someone about you know, starting their own business or, or, or they're looking at going out on their own, that, that's one of the first things I would say is you know, get, get a mentor or seek people out. Um, why? Why is it so important? I think, I think that your, your family and friends love you. They love you too much. They're never going to really tell you how it is. Um, and then when you have, I guess, people who are senior around you but are commercially involved with you, there's a bias another way, which is there may be something commercially uh, to be gained and so the interaction can become you know, perhaps a, a, a little bit uh, yeah, less objective and less helpful for you. So with the mentor-mentee relationship, whether they're in your industry or not, um, it, it can really help, I think, provide perspective uh, these are people who have done it before. They, they can share with you, you know, all, all of their learnings and failures and things like that, and, and we've all got them. Um, and that can, A, help you, I think, you know, hopefully not make those mistakes, um, but B, I guess, help you understand that everyone everyone has their journey and, and that, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, you know, getting something a bit wrong and, and, and everyone's kind of done it and you take it as a learning opportunity. So I think there's... There's a lot in that. And then on the flip side, I think when you're a, a mentor or a coach yourself, um, it's, it's incredibly rewarding to give back um, and to help, I guess, you know, next generation or, or what have you, you know, do better businesses, contribute more to the community, things like that. Because that's, that's when you're coming up, that's kind of what you get. And so when you're, when you're able to give forward, you know, it's, it's, it's just helping, it's helping everyone. Um, 
how do we find these mentors? I think is always a challenge. Uh, I don't believe they should be forced relationships. So I don't think you kind of go onto a mentor mentee forum or, or whatever and kind of say, I am looking for a mentor. I think that's a little bit artificial and it, it has the danger of becoming a constructed relationship that maybe doesn't help either side. Um, I think these things can be quite organic just by talking to people who are more experienced, talking to friends of friends and you know colleagues and so on and, until it kind of forms quite naturally. Um, and then you try and make it semi, semi-regular, semi-appointment based where you meet one another and have specific questions that you want to address. It's not just a, a catch up. You don't want it to become a friendship. That is not a good mentor-mentee relationship. It really should be, I think, the imparting of experiences and, and wisdom. And then that's, that's kind of how it grows. So yeah, big believer in that. Um, I think Australia and Sydney has a great um, sort of community and collegiality about it. And I, I've sort of always found mentors along the way. Um, and as much as I can, try and try and share my experience. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome, mate. What a great answer. And yeah, I completely agree with that. With um, Definitely had many coaches and mentors as I do now to help me along the journey to really compress time. And also, yeah, like you said, is you know, find the one that resonates with you. And I think, you know, whether it's even, you know, from my perspective, you know, looking at them on social media, things like that, which is obviously a lot bigger, seeing what they're up to, getting a bit of a feel and then you yeah. know, a bit of a chat or, or potentially being introduced, um, how it works as well. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, you know, talk about all the awesome stuff that happens, um, but not everyone talks about the failures um, like that because they don't want to necessarily want to talk about them. So yeah. you want to maybe share a bit of that side and maybe one of the, the biggest sort of business failures and how you overcame it, I guess, or, or a challenge that popped up in, in your journey, whether it's now, whether it's before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many. Um, I'll, I'll give it one. I'll give one from each business and, you know, we can kind of dig, dig deeper if we want, but um, yeah, I, Unfortunately, there might be a theme between the two of them, which shows maybe I've learned nothing. But anyway, we'll see, we'll see how we go. Um, with, with Flipsters, um, we, we found some international um, distributors. So we so we'd sort of just launched as a new product. It's a great folding shoe. And you know, we got a lot of press in the beginning. Uh, it was two young guys who kind of started this, this, this shoe um, to, to help women when they're, they're on their night out. And... Um, very quickly, we had distributors who, who were interested in taking us overseas. Now, one from Canada, one, one from, um, well, based in Austria, but it was for, for Europe. Um, and we, we didn't think there was any challenge in just saying to the factory, which was based in China, just pump out you know, some additional shoes, thanks. Um, and so we put this big order, and we'd only really ordered sort of once or twice, and we were, you know, we were a startup. We're just going through a relatively low level of inventory. Put this big order in, managed to convince the distributors to pay us first, um, which was unusual. So we were able to manage cash flow. We thought we were quite clever. Um, and off go the shoes from China to uh, Canada directly, Austria directly, and Australia directly. Now, obviously, geographically, Australia is closest to China, which means we got our shipment first of that batch of shoes. Um, and the Flipsters technology required a very special combination of rubber, um, to give them that ability to flex without breaking. And there's a special recipe and it had to be followed exactly. So we opened up the shoes um, and we had back orders ourselves in Australia. And the first pair ripped, it just ripped right open. Um, and well, okay, that's weird. And then we opened up another pair and they ripped and they just kept ripping. And we realized that the rubber was faulty, that the whole batch was, was basically screwed. Um, and that at that very moment, there was you know, a container load on its way to Canada and another container going to, um, to Austria. And this was the first time these guys had dealt with us. And we had to make uh, very tough phone calls to both of those distributors who'd already paid us saying, you know, we, we stuffed up. We basically didn't, we trusted the factory. We didn't get on the ground enough. We didn't kind of check, 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 and we should have. Um, and that was, that was just terrible. Terrible for cash flow, terrible. It was just heartbreaking. They were really good about it and we were able to kind of turn it around and, and, and kind of deploy in those markets eventually. But um, yeah, I, I think the lesson there is just, just about really double checking everything when you can and particularly when you're going international, I guess not to go too fast. So 
that that's kind of one. Um, and with Food by Us, you know, similar sort of thing in that we we devised this great technology to allow all the suppliers to enter into the venues when they're do, doing deliveries just by kind of using a, a Bluetooth. We built sort of procured all these great Bluetooth lockbox devices that were going to allow us to send unique codes to all of the suppliers and go in and, you know, it was going to be tech just on steroids, uh, but these Bluetooth devices that were meant to sit at the outside of a venue and provide access into the venue weren't exactly weatherproof. So, you know, suppliers are delivering at 3, 4, 5 a.m. in the morning. So our customer support team just starts getting call after call after call saying the, the Bluetooth devices don't work, I can't access the venue, can't drop off the goods, you know, um, what have you sort of done here? You've, you've, you've given us an order and we can't really deliver it. Um, and again, I think there, you know, there's, there's real dangers in deploying really good, sexy technology too quickly. We have a huge network of hundreds of these things out there. Um, we're probably like just a mechanical, mechanical lockbox just would have done just fine, you know? <laughs> So yeah, uh, those are two sorts of stories. And I, I think, yeah, uh, often it's exciting to sort of run ahead and kind of um, you know, deploy something that's new or take the opportunity that's new. And, and um, you can check as best you can, but sometimes it might still go wrong. And, and sometimes it's better to, I think, take a bit of a step back as exciting as it might be and really assess every opportunity, whether you're ready to take it on. Because if you're not, you'll be in a much worse off position than if you had just said to them, can we put it on hold for four or five months, which feels like, you know, it feels like a, a generous, insane amount of time when you're running as fast as you can, but perhaps that's better uh, to, to, to do for the business. So yeah, th those are just two sorts of stories and, and trust me, there's, there's many more. So yeah. Awesome, mate. Thanks for sharing. And it just, you know, I think brings context, you know, to everybody in business that there's always problems, you know, and it's about how you overcome them um, and, and try and, you know, with coaches and mentors, like you mentioned before, can you get a lot of people in the room to sort of think about things how you can sort of maybe preempt or not have as many um, issues um, in the journey. So love that, mate. Um, and, and, you know, I guess piloting maybe certain things first before rolling them out big um, might be a good um, thing as well um, at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah good way of putting it. <laughs> um so yeah we, we, we've we've covered so much today and it's been amazing i guess as we're wrapping up um you know you're a wealth of knowledge um what one key piece of advice i guess would you give to all the entrepreneurs uh, watching and listening today um i have found in, in my experience that looking at data uh, around your customers as much as possible is probably in my experience you know the single best thing you can do to direct when you're having these these external questions come about, you know, do I take that opportunity or not? Do we go in this uh, change direction of how our product develops or not? Generally, I've, I've found that the data of how your customers are behaving, so who's sticky or not, you know, who's, who's coming back, how much are they spending, uh, what's your cost of acquisition and, and, and why, what, what's, what's kind of driving that, and really just looking at who we've got now and then how that kind of may or may not change based on the new the new opportunity or the new risk, depending on what it may be. That is always the first and last place that I want to go to, to help make my, my decisions. And, and I think uh, it is very easy to get excited and it's very easy to get scared by opportunity or risk or whatever the thing is, but often buried within the data of your existing customers and, and what they're showing you behaviorally. You don't need to do surveys all the time and things like that. What people say and what they do can be very different things. So it's, for me, look at the data, look at it a million different ways, and generally the answer on that thing will, will become uh, hopefully a bit clearer, although not always perfect, but a bit clearer. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Um, definitely uh, measure and manage the numbers. That's how you really grow a business and make better decisions. Love that. So yeah, we connected through our networks where I learned about your awesome journey from founding your first business flipsters uh, in your mid twenties to now co-founding food vast alongside the, you know, the founders of menu log, the online marketplace that connects restaurants, cafes, and caterers with hundreds of wholesale food suppliers, 
you're innovating the hospitality tech ecosystem in a big way, which is awesome. You're an awesome guy as well. Um, so much wealth of knowledge and experience here. And I'm sure you'll continue to help all parties in the hospitality tech ecosystem to succeed um, as much as possible. So yeah, I'm very grateful that we connected and I look forward to working with you in the future. So Ben, uh, how can people find you getting in contact with you? Yeah, the best way, honestly, is just to head to the website. So if you go to foodbyus.com.au, uh, you can read a bit more about us, obviously sign up for free, have a bit of a look around. Um, yeah, that's just the best way. Yeah, awesome, mate. Love that. Everybody definitely check out foodbyus.com.au. It's an amazing platform and you've already heard it um, in so many different ways from Ben. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for watching and listening to this show where we talk about everything on business growth. Please like, subscribe and leave us a five-star review. You can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube as Ethan Cassiotis or visit my website, ethancassiotis.com. I completely agree with you. Or do I? The only way we know is if you tune in next time. So until next time, remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear. So remember to design your growth and results. Thank you.